Welcome to the Awesome Early Bird Podcast. It's your old pal Emac coming to you with one Adam Ship, my money share, as we're getting ready for a so happy it's Thursday slate. And Adam is so happy because he did get his money shipped from DraftKings. Of course, it was not uh, Tuesday night, it was Wednesday morning. But Adam, you are the big winner. 50 large for the top prize there. How did it feel with the uh, the multi-hour sweat? Did you did you go to sleep for this one or after last time when you went to sleep for that extended innings game and woke up uh, tens of thousands of dollars poorer? What uh, what did you do with this sweat? No, I was awake for the entire baseball related sweat. I did not stay. I didn't know that I was also sweating uh, stat correction until 10 o'clock Wednesday morning, but um, I, I stayed awake for the games. Luckily, one, the the last game did go into extra innings, but Matt Olson walked it off in like the tenth, so I didn't have to wait too long on that. It was w- once the Mets blew Syndergaard's win, it was pretty much locked up. So like, I mean, th- there was still stuff that could have gone wrong. Also, once the Dodgers game ended, like if the Angels had had you know like monster innings or something, but for the most part, as far as baseball sweats go, it was uh, one, once the Mets and Dodgers games ended, it was pretty much just like running out the clock. Very nice, very nice. Well, I was fast asleep in bed, so I missed out on this. But congratulations, nonetheless. Thank that's you. That's a very, very nice win. Very solid one. Just in time for football season, so that's always fun. It's perfect. Speaking of which, nice transition. You are such a company man, Adam. We do have free NFL season-long content. That is draft content. Uh, you get Alex Osmo's uh, season-long projections, his rankings. If you'd like to uh, have a bit of an advantage going into your draft, here's someone that uh, thinks about things a lot differently. Uh, than the rest of us you got best ball content and then you have a team by team preview and they're actually robust and well written nolan kelly has uh, done the majority of them and then he has uh ben rossa and chris bags are chiming in on them and then chris uh and Lafie are going back and forth on value draft picks uh as well so there's a lot of good content that's all free so all free up until we get to dfs time but that uh, will be there if you go up to the awesome homepage. In the upper uh, left, towards the left, you'll see a football uh, tab. Click on that, and it will take you to all of the articles. All right, Adam, we got uh, two slates here. We got a sixer there uh, for our main slate, and then we got a little three-gamer here for the early slate. It looks like everybody's kind of skipping uh, the 3 o'clock game between the Milwaukee Brewers and Oakland Athletics, so we shall do the same on that one. But uh, let's just hit real quick here for gamers that want to get their uh, their action in early. You will still have the DFS strategy show on Thursday. That'll be at 9.30, uh, and they will most likely talk about all these games in great detail. But uh, our first one here, Adam, we have Michael Pineda in Florida taking on the Marlins. Yo- uh, I almost said Jordan Jamamoto. I need to go to bed. It's your, I almost did it again. Jordan Yamamoto at 6,400. Now it's a tough matchup here against the Twins. We know that Yamamoto has been slightly pitching above his weight class. I uh, did not really, uh, he skipped triple A and the regression monster is going to be coming or so we think. I mean, Jamie Moyer uh, went his entire career without the regression mo- monster really getting to him. Some guys, just the way they pitch, the way they locate, and the spin on the ball does good things for them. I do not think Yamamoto is going to be one of those guys, but we do have no Nelson Cruz because he does not play the field, and this game is in Marlins uh, Park. What do you want to do here with either of these guys? I'm guessing it's going to be Pineda, but we are paying a premium. Yeah, I mean, Pineda is obviously the more appealing of the two. Miami right now with a 3.6 implied run total. Not great numbers for Pineda this year. 21.9% strikeout percentage. A good 4.8% walk percentage, though. A pretty you know average 4.5x FIP. But getting a really favorable matchup against Miami in Miami. Um, I mentioned it a couple of times over the last couple of days, but with Miami... The, the, with their current roster, you really do have to pay attention to who's in the actual lineup because they're. If, if you just look at active roster numbers, it says they're one of the best strikeout matchups, but there's at least potential for them to run out actually a low strikeout lineup. Uh, Miguel Rojas, Starling Castro, Harold Ramirez. There's uh, uh, Miguel um, Mar- or Martin Prado. Um, Brian Holiday are all lower strikeout guys, while uh, so is Brian Anderson, while guys like Garrett Cooper, Neil Walker, Alfaro, Granderson, Puelo are all high strikeout guys. So a, a lot will come down to what the actual Miami lineup is. Either way, it's a favorable matchup in terms of uh, preventing runs. It's just a matter of exactly how much strikeout upside is there. 
All right, and then uh, on the other side, Yamamoto, not really interested in him. On uh, FanDuel, he is 6,400. Going to be a tough ask to even get a quality start, let alone the win. And then on DK, where we do need two pitchers, he is 7,900. But uh, I, I don't really hate that because once we start talking about the other guys, yeah, and we got a roster two of them. This might be a slate to uh, take off. Oh, they did put the Milwaukee game on this slate. My bad. That's weird. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, going on to our next game here, San Francisco finishing up their series in Philadelphia. You have Jake Arrieta going against Derek Rodriguez. That is one of the scarier pitchers uh, out there. Rodriguez just does not strike guys out. He is not uh, Brett Anderson bad, but he's pretty darn close. He strikes out about 0. 0.6, maybe 0. 0.63 uh, strikeouts per inning. That's not great. Uh, he doesn't give up a ton of power, but he does when he is on the road. Uh, causes uh, problems. Uh, this year, he's actually been pretty decent uh, in his home away games. Uh, four home runs at home, six on the road. But uh, generally, he trends towards being worse on the road. If I'm going to do anybody here or roll with anybody, I think it would be Jake Arrieta. But this is, his, he. I mean, when was the last time he had a double-digit digit, uh, fantasy performance? Adam, let alone uh, double-digit strikeouts. Right, and while the Giants are a favorable matchup, it is worth mentioning that they're a predominantly left-handed lineup, and Arietta's been real bad against lefties. Um, his numbers against righties have been fine this year, but um, against lefties, only a 14.2% strikeout percentage, 399 expected Woba, 242 expected ISO. Not the best lefties in this lineup, but Belt certainly can do some damage. Alex Dickerson was a late scratch yesterday, so... Remains to be seen if he'll be in the lineup, but if he is, he's a, a power left-handed bat. Affordable pricing on Brandon Crawford. Yastrzemski's okay. Panic's really cheap. It, it's not an ideal matchup in terms of the platoon splits for Arietta, but he is cheap, and the Giants overall are, are a lackluster offense. So um, because of the other options on the slate, certainly will have interest in Arietta, but I think it's a spot where you know maybe you should be a little bit cautious. All right, uh, moving along here again, just four games on this early slate. You have the Mets and White Sox finishing up their series. Zach Wheeler, most expensive pitcher uh, of the early slate. He has been solid uh, at certain times. Th this is a good matchup for him. He should be facing a fair number of righties. He does have uh, at least you know decent to above, well, it's well above average this year. He's, he's averaging about one. 0.1 strikeouts per inning, so that's pretty darn good. Wheeler, that is 137 and 124 in the third innings, although the rest of his numbers are mediocre at best. But uh, the matchup does put him in the crosshairs as someone to pull the trigger on and get on your lineups. That was probably not the best analogy in today's world, but it came out. Dylan Cease, Adam, on the other hand, there's some joke in there about Dylan ceasing to be good, but he's never been good yet. He's only been bad. 23 years old. This will be his fifth start in the majors. He's carrying a 6.86 ERA, a 1.62 whip. He has 21 strikeouts in 21 and a third innings. He has a very good fastball. He's uh, I've written about him twice now. He's kind of like Nuke Lelouch. He doesn't know where it's going to go. And he has garbage for his secondary offerings. They're all mediocre at best, but he does have a good fastball. Um, so that's where he's getting his strikeouts. Now, the one thing I do want to point out before I turn this over to you, last game was his lowest pitch count thus far of his four starts, and that was at 98. So from a pitch per dollar standpoint, this isn't the worst place to go. I think we're going to get 95, 100 pitches from him. But what's going to happen in those 95 to 100 pitches, Adam? Right. I mean, I think he's got good stuff. Like his slider curveball both grayed out really well too. Um, fastball is his best pitch, but control is is the big issue. You know, at, at AAA this year, he walked 10.5%. So far this year, he's at 12.4% in the majors. Um, he hasn't had a single stop in the minor leagues with a sub 10% walk percentage, except for high A ball last year in 71 and two thirds innings, he only walked 9.7%. So that's been a real issue for him in the minors. And it's 
something that will at the very least affect his consistency. He has the stuff to put together good games, but when you really when you lack control, a lot of uh, a high percentage of the time, these same pitchers will lack command too. So not only is he walking too many guys, but he's also most likely making mistakes in the strike zone, which is where you really get hit hard in addition to those walks. The Mets are a, a pretty good lineup. You know, um, McNeil, Conforto, Alonzo, all good hitters. Cano is not bad. Ramos is, is a pretty good hitting catcher. Um, J.D. Davis has made some strides at the plate. It's not a, a you know pushover Mets lineup here. They have a five and a half implied run total. And Cease isn't really cheap. So I, I've been trying, I've been waiting for him to get to a good spot at a good price tag. And it just, it just hasn't happened. And it's not happening again today. Um, as far as Wheeler, I think he's pretty clearly the number one pitcher. Um, he's somehow still on the Mets. Thought for sure he would be traded at the deadline, but uh, he's, he's still there. He's allowed to go deep in the games, has a very long leash, has a favorable matchup against the White Sox. He's just not that much more expensive than Pineda. And he's a better pitcher. So in you know, a really good matchup as well. So um, Wheeler is my, my number one guy. All right. A final game here. Uh, we've got some conflicting information on pitching, but it looks like Chase Anderson and Daniel Mengden will be the options. Uh, those guys are, I don't know, kind of like mirror images of each other because they don't really strike out a lot. They don't really get all blown up, but uh, they tend to never be comfortable when you are watching them if you have rostered them. Do you like either of these guys? Not really, but in the context of the slate and having to roster pitchers, they're both viable, I think, because of the park. It's only expected to be like 62 degrees in Oakland. You know, um, one one game on the slates in Philadelphia, one game is in Chicago, and then you have two favorable pitchers parks with Miami and, and Oakland. Um, not a great matchup for either guy. Mangdon's really cheap, so you're kind of just hoping that he gets you enough innings and a you know, handful of strikeouts and then just gets out of the game. Chase Anderson has the better strikeout stuff, but it's a pretty brutal matchup for him as far as the type of pitcher he is and the lineup he's going against. Oakland has one of the top five ISOs in baseball this year against right-handed pitching. They have a lineup full of right-handed power and low strikeout percentages. Chase Anderson has been reverse splits for most of his career, and this year has been no exception. Um, against righties, Anderson has uh, – pulling the numbers up now but um, against righties chase anderson has allowed a 359 expected woba and a 204 expected iso this season compared to against lefties a 255 expected woba and an expected iso below 100 so um it, it's pretty dangerous facing you know semi and chapman Kana, davis possibly pinder possibly josh fagley behind the plate who has power uh it's a really dangerous spot but i can see getting to some just because of you know, like I, I prefer him over Dylan Cease. I prefer him. I guess that's the only one that I can say for sure. I prefer him over, but um, <laughs> he, he's not worse than Yamamoto. He's not worse than Arietta. There we go. Context. And that, I mean, that's what it is. It's not like some other players that we're going against have a secret group of player player pools that uh, they can access and, and come up with different right. guys. We all sort of have the same people to choose among. But uh, in any event, there's your early slate. Now let's get on to the main slate. Hey, main slate means Yahoo, means presenting sponsor of the Early Bird Podcast, Yahoo. They do have the management fee free contest up. Reminder, they do have 12% management fee on all of their other contests. No contests allow more than 10 entries in them. That management fee free one is 1500 uh, gamers on Thursday. It's a $4,500 prize pool, 4500 bucks in, 4500 out. That will uh, most likely fill around lunchtime Eastern uh, tomorrow. So if you want to play that, definitely jump on in. A uh, couple trades, uh, Adam. Greinke is now with Houston, and Trevor Bauer is now with Cincinnati. I, I don't understand what Cincinnati was doing there, but hey, more power to them. And then uh, I understand what Houston is doing because they got a taste of the World Series. They want another one. Yeah, I think that the Houston trade was interesting. They didn't give up anyone that I think is likely to be great, but they did give up four or three of their top prospects, four prospects total. And jo Josh was talking about it in the chat. And I, I agree, at least to some extent. How much does Granky? obviously he's – He's an upgrade over Wade Miley, but how much does Granke actually improve their chances of winning the World Series when you consider that Garrett Cole and Justin Verlander are going to make every single playoff start that they possibly can? Um, I mean, it, it's an upgrade. It's just, uh, I don't know. It, it felt like they gave up a lot uh, for him, I guess. 
Yeah, it, it and that's that's kind of where I was landing. Or I mean, I didn't. So my thought is this: it, they're really they put all their star so playoff games are way different than they used to be. It's not like you 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 run your main guys into the ground like they used to. They they will your two or three best pitchers are going to be make on, making all the starts in the series. But then everybody else goes into the bullpen and they've uh, really over the last couple of years done really liberal use of the other starters that way because it's not like they have to bring them in every day and they can bring those guys in for for one or two innings. And it, it's even better than, than a, general, a normal reliever, um, or the depth, I should say, increases uh, dramatically. So it, it, it's hard to say uh, what sort of a difference maker it's going to be. And, and even when you talk about Wade Miley, I mean, we, we're joking about it. He's last, and I don't remember what he did in his start number 38, but in the 37 prior to this one, he had given up more than four runs zero times and four runs four times. Um, that is relatively impressive if that's your fourth starter going into a potential playoff series. Um, does give up the home run from time to time, but usually nobody's on base. But how different is that than Grinky? is my thing? Because Grinky doesn't have the fastball anymore. Right. Um, so one thing I just kind of thought of too and uh, confirmed it, but Grinky's under contract through 2021. Garrett Cole's a free agent after this year. Oh. So they do at least get, obviously he's not Garrett Cole level, uh, pitcher, but they do at least get some sort of insurance policy on Cole as well. That that makes a little bit more sense in that context. Thank you. That is look at that, Adam. Look at you breaking this stuff down like a pro, like it's your job. <laughs> Although to be fair, that part's not your job, but you like baseball, so it's easy to do. All right, let's get to this main slate here. Let's hit it while it's hot. We've got uh, Toronto and Baltimore. It looks like uh, our pal Trent. Thornton is going to be coming off the injured list. Uh, he's been dealing with a sore elbow. He last pitched on the 20th of July, so he basically missed one start. I believe it was just elbow inflammation, so uh, not anything to be overly concerned about. He is going against Toronto that, or uh, Baltimore. Solid matchup for him. And Asher Wojciechowski, Adam. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn you loose on Asher. He's had two good starts. He's 7,100, and you know what? Going against Baltimore, not exactly the most daunting of lineups. Uh, they got rid of a couple of veterans, and they got a bunch of these guys. I recognize their names, but I, but they're all young. I don't know who they are. But what? B B Bichette, Guerrero, Biggio? These names sound familiar to me, Adam. Yeah, a lot of a lot of young talent on <laughs> Toronto now with, you know, Biggio, Guerrero, uh, Bichette, Guriel. Um, and you still have, you know, Smoke and Grichik and, and McKinney. Like, it, it's not a bad lineup, but I am really, really, really interested in Wojciechowski here. This is the first, like, good matchup he's had in a while, but he's dominated uh, regardless. His last three starts are against the Nats, the Red Sox, and the Angels. You know, a tough matchup, a tougher matchup, and then, like, the toughest matchup. 15.8% swinging strike percentage against the Nats with a 38.3% chase percentage, 21.9% swinging strike percentage against the Red Sox with a 45.8% chase percentage, and a 14% swinging strike percentage against the Angels with a 32.7% chase percentage. For context, uh, your, your league average swinging strike percentage is going to be you know right around 10.5%, 11%. Chase percentage is between 30 and 31% most seasons. And he's putting these numbers up against, you know, the Angels and the Red Sox, two of the toughest teams to strike out. The Nats aren't an easy team to strike out. He made one start against Toronto already this year. And by the way, had a 22.5% swinging strike percentage with a 43.4% um, O swing percentage. Digging into his stuff a little bit before his last start, I did notice that his slider had a couple extra inches of depth compared to the last time he was in the major leagues. So that potentially could be a reason that he's been so good. But I think it all is likely to just be something that you can't really find in a lot of the stats you dig into. Like I think it's probably just that a lot of his stuff comes out on the same plane and is really difficult to pick up because there's nothing that jumps off, or at least that I found yet, looking through numbers where it's just like, oh, wow, this is you know what happened with the exception of some extra movement on his slider. But the numbers that he's putting up have been pretty incredible in terms of, of the swinging strike stuff. Um, trying to get – I'm looking now at his – or I'm pulling up now his, his uh, raw pitch totals. He had against um, the Nats, he had – Sorry, this page isn't doing more. Okay, so against the Nats, he had a total of 15 
swings and misses. Against Boston, he had 23 swings and misses. And against the Angels, he had 14. Uh, the slider accounted for six against the Angels, nine against the Red Sox, two against the Nats, um, six in that last start against Toronto. But he's also getting swings and misses on his fastball, seven against the Nats, eight against the Red Sox, four against the Angels, eight against the Blue Jays. His cutter uh, had you know five, six, and four in the last three starts. He's getting swings and misses on multiple pitches. Um, he's facing a Toronto offense that, even though it has some young talent, it's not in the same category as those last three he's faced. And he's still reasonably priced. So it, it's scary because he has a, mo- a longer track record of being mediocre than of, of being this pitcher. But um, he's been really impressive so far. All right. That is going to be your play of the day. Of course, you can tune in to the Deep Dive. That is later uh on Thursday, that will be at uh, five o'clock. You can check out Adam's thoughts on that one, and also the deep dive, the article behind the paywall. There'll be lots more good stuff there on that one. Uh, any interest in Thornton coming off the DL amongst our dozen of options, or our dozen? Not, options? not too much. Um, for one, you know, he is coming off the injured list, but also Baltimore's. I mean, it's not a good lineup, but they do have a lot of lefties in there, and Thornton's really struggled with lefties this year. So I could see if you're max centering tournaments getting to a little bit just because, you know, he's he's affordable. But I right now, at least, I would just rather get to Wojciechowski. Um, I would rather get to Max Freed, who's less expensive. Um, I, I just don't really see myself getting to a lot of Thornton. Yeah, uh, the other thing I did want to call out on Wojciechowski, 37 on yahoo that is one of the cheaper guys it doesn't really look like there's going to be a bargain basement person uh there's a couple other guys that are a little bit below him we'll talk about them shortly here but uh let's continue on oh i guess one of them's going to be in this next game here tampa bay at boston it is going to be andrew Kashner, 5400 there on DraftKings, i like that i like that a lot actually uh you have brendan mckay on the other side he is back up from um durham uh that guy's been bouncing up and down they are trying to squeeze every little bit of his uh service time uh or, or keep it keep the clock not ticking but they want him for the playoff run here uh they've acquired a, a couple hitters so we'll have to see what tampa bay is going to do here tall order taking mckay in Boston against the Red Sox. So I don't really want to do that. I was all excited to go stream on one of my season-long teams, but no, I'm not doing that because I think it's too tough of a matchup. On the other side, though, um, we have Andrew Kashner, who on DK at least is going to provide some significant savings. Adam, if we go with uh, Kashner and Wojciechowski, not the worst way to go. Uh, We can get all the bats we want on DraftKings. Yeah, it's not the worst, but I would rather go to Max Freed at 5,800 than Kashner at 5,400. Um, just better strikeout stuff, much better pitcher in Freed. Kashner, it's not an easy matchup here against Tampa. The game's in Boston, so it's a um, park. It's a positive park shift for the Rays. He's Kashner's cheap enough where if I get to... Oh, no. Did we lose Adam? We may have. No. Oh, you're still there. You said if it's cheap enough to get to Adam or get to get to Caster, you want to go to Freed, I think is where you were saying. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just prefer Freed and cheap enough that if I get some in tournaments, it's okay, but he's not a priority for me because I think Freed's just much, much better. All right. And then sort of your assessment on McKay, just too tough of a matchup to consider? Yeah, it's, it's a really brutal spot. All right. Houston, Garrett Cole uh, going against Cleveland, finishing up this series. Danny Salazar coming in off of uh, minor league rehab. He did make six appearances down in the minors. The first one was on June 30th. He went 18 pitches. July 5th, he went 27. The 11th, he went 46. The 16th, he went 58. The 21st, he went 64. And the 27th, he went 69. I'm going to guess what? Ooh, that was a nice outing. I'm going to guess 70 to 75 pitches in this one. Adam, what are your thoughts here uh, on Salazar before we get to Garrett Cole? Because that's a tough matchup here for Salazar against Houston. Yeah, I'm not looking to really get this out to Salazar here. Tough matchup, first start back. Um, just kind of, I think, unnecessary. All right. Garrett Cole, let's hear what you got. Amazing strikeout numbers, that's for sure. Uh, he's, in my opinion, been the best, at least DFS starter in baseball. Uh, number one strikeout percentage, number one XFIP. Um, walk percentage is good, not the best, but good. Um, you know, obviously just a, a dominant strikeout guy. He's facing an Indians team that 
Their active roster has a low strikeout percentage against right-handed pitching, but for one, you could potentially see some more strikeouts in this lineup with the addition of uh, Fran Mil Reyes and, and Yasiel Puig. But also, um, the current construction is a lot of left-handed hitters. And just like we saw with Justin Verlander, despite being right-handed, Cole is uh, has a higher strikeout percentage against lefties. He's struck out 40.6% of left-handed hitters this year. I'm not going to be deterred by guys like Jake Bowers and Greg Allen and Tyler Naquin if they're in the lineup just because the Indians overall have a low strikeout percentage. Um, I'll, I'll take my chances with Cole. He racks up strikeouts against everyone. He's expensive, but it's not super prohibitive. You know, there's no course field game. There is cheap pitching that you can go to, whether it's Wojciechowski in the mid-range or Freed at the bottom. Um, I, I'll get to a lot of Garrett Cole. All right, that uh, definitely makes sense. He is 60 on Yahoo, 50. 51 is Kershaw, uh, and then it drops off into the 30s from that point, upper 30s down to the lower 30s. So you can tell he's kind of head and shoulders above everybody else, but that will be uh, costing you a bat or two. It probably will be somewhat unique on Yahoo. I don't know about DK yet because it all depends who we get uh, as cheapies coming in as an outfielder, things shaking out after the trade deadline with uh, – people in, in transit or passing physicals, etc. So uh, we'll have to see what happens when the dust clears. Three more games to go. We have John Flaherty taking on the Chicago Cubs for the th- fourth time uh, this season. You have John Lester taking on St. Louis for just the second time. Uh, Lester has been, well, I'm going to have to say it, pretty damn good, at least from surface numbers. 3.63 ERA, 110 strikeouts in 114 innings. Uh, 1.3 whip and uh, 18 home runs allowed in his 20 starts. Uh, that is across again 114 innings. So pretty solid numbers overall for him. Uh, but he is facing a mostly righty lineup there for uh, the Redbirds, who are missing, missing, missing too many of their key players uh, at this point. Be with Ozuna, Molina. Um, there are, is word that Matt Carpenter might come back by the weekend, before the weekend, but he's been, uh, I don't know, I think through his first 17 at-bats in the minors, Adam, he didn't have a hit, so they were kind of hoping he would do better, Uh, but we'll have to see. Talk to me about Lester. Oh, and my assessment on Flaherty, it's all going to depend on how many lefties are in the lineup for the Cubs. Yeah, that's pretty much mine on Flaherty, too. Both of these guys are secondary options for me. Um, Lester's having a nice bounce back on his way out but this year his numbers are much more aligned with what we were getting in previous seasons there are a lot of righties in this lineup but not a lot of of really good righties here he has struck out 23.1 percent of right-handed hitters he's allowed a 322 expected wobo 186 expected iso so just pretty you know mediocre numbers not great not bad uh paul goldschmidt tyler o'neill de jong all will make good plays as will jose martinez um and i i could see having interest more interest in lester if i didn't really like Wojciechowski and if we didn't have a free cheap guy in Max Freed. So um, if, if I get to some in tournaments at low ownership, I think that's fine. The same really goes for Flaherty. If for some reason the Cubs run out a right-handed heavy lineup, then it's a, a nice boost. We're talking about a 32% strikeout percentage against righties for Flaherty compared to about 20% against lefties. Uh, sorry, 21.8% against lefties. 206 expected ISO to lefties, 129 to righties. He's just been flat out dominant against right-handed hitters. But the Cubs should have Robel Garcia, Anthony Rizzo, Hayward, Happ, and Schwarber all in the lineup from the left side, making it you know a kind of mediocre matchup and a middle of the road price tag on Flaherty. So um, I think he's still a high upside arm, but again, it's just hard for me to pay for him as opposed to a couple other guys I like. All right, and there's uh, two of your cheapies right there for uh, the Cubbies uh, on DraftKings. Robel Garcia, 3,300. You've got uh, Ian Happ, uh, who, oh, I guess he's only outfield eligible. He's 3,400. And then uh, on the other side, Jose Martinez, who's pretty good against lefties, should be in the top third of the order for the Redbirds. He is 3,500. So we got some cheapies here and there uh, to make some of these top-end pitchers work two more games to go anthony desclafani is going to be 7300 i guess he is in play it's going to be a tough one there in atlanta it'd be a little bit cooler than it has been recently in the mid 70s uh there is high humidity and there is a chance for showers in the area the worst issue other than showers uh would be wait for it all the lefties that the braves can bring to bear against 
uh, Descofani because we know they've got Freeman. They'll probably have Brian McCann. You got Camargo and Ciarte. Oh yeah, uh, Ozzy Albies. Here, I hear he's pretty good. Uh, so that's going to be a tough yeah, one. Uh, yeah, it's not a great matchup for Descofani. Um, Albies, Freeman, McCann, and Ciarte Camargo, all lefties. He's another one similar to Flaherty, except worse against lefties. Um, and the righties in this lineup obviously are good too with Acuna, Donaldson, um, Duvall apparently is back to like 2015 or whatever year it was. He was good. Um, yeah, it's it's better when he hits two home runs a game now, Adam. That's what Yeah, is. I mean, I, I had him in my, my winning lineup, so I, I'm loving Adam Duvall right now. But uh, yeah, not just not a great spot for Desclafani. Um, kind of my, my interest level in him would fall into like the same category as John Lester where I – wouldn't be surprised if I got like five to 10% in the tournament just because there's only 12 pitchers on the slate and I might decide not to have all of it tied, all of my exposure tied up in three different, in three guys, but it, it won't be a lot. All right. Uh, any additional words you want to do on max or shall we save that for the other shows? Oh uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just going to roster a ton. He's $5,800. He's got a decent matchup against the reds outside of Cincinnati. There's no Puig in this lineup anymore. Um, you know, it's, it's a pretty ugly looking lineup. Now, you know, you look at the projected lineup, Nick Senzel, Joey Votto, Eugenio Suarez. Okay. Like they, they're all good. Philip Irvin's whatever. Jose Iglesias, Jose Peraza, Jesse Winker from the left side, Kyle Farmer and a pitcher. Um, I don't know why Max Fried's fifty eight hundred dollars. He's not been a great strikeout pitcher, but he hasn't been bad either. And uh, the walk percentage has come down this year as well. His PCRA is in the mid uh, mid to high threes. He's just been a pretty good pitcher. He doesn't give up a lot of barrels. He he prevents hard contact. Um, I'm gonna get to tons of Max Fried. All right, that takes us to the last game. By the last game, I mean oh good god, this one's starting three hours after the rest of them. It is the lone. Game starting after 7.20. The San Diego Padres in Los Angeles taking on the Dodgers in Chavez Ravine. Clayton Kershaw taking the bump for the Dodgers. And Joey Lucchese going against the Dodgers. Let's see. Lucchese will be facing the Dodgers for the third time this season. Through the first two starts, he's gone 11 and a third inning, giving up two home runs. Six strikeouts, which is well off his usual pace. And then Kershaw has gone against the Dodgers, pardon me, gone against the Padres. This will be his fourth time, and he has just uh, pounded them into submission. They did touch him up for four home runs, but he's got 20 strikeouts in his 20 innings, 3.1 ERA, .95 whip. We are paying a lot for him, but I think he is an option on this unique slate adam with six games we've got some decision points here between him and cole and a variety of other guys how do you feel about our last two hurlers of the night not really interested in lucchese because it's just a a really tough matchup for him the price tag is affordable but i just don't think it's that necessary um on the other side though kershaw clearly a, a top option have plenty of strikeouts in their lineup they just lost one of their best power hitters in front of reyes in the trade involving trevor bauer so that's one less power bat in there. Um, and, and Kershaw is, you know, affordably priced. The the issue for me, and I'm kind of excited about it from a tournament standpoint, is I think Kershaw is going to project really, really well, as he should. Uh, the Padres right now actually have the lowest implied run total on the slate. But I think as far as range of outcomes goes, Garrett Cole's ceiling is just so much higher because you're talking about a 37 to a 38% strikeout percentage compared to, I think, Kershaw this year is at like 23 and a half, 24%. Um, that that's a huge, huge difference. And it's if you're going to get the ownership basically split between these guys, or even if people are going to favor Kershaw because he's slightly cheaper, I'll gladly take the guy that is striking out nearly 40% of the batters that he faces. There we are. Words to live by. That'll get her done. You can follow Adam at ship my money DFS on Twitter. You can find me at Emac DFS. And of course it is Osmo underscore C O M. Check out the pin tweets. We have a variety of them, uh, giving away a variety of things. You got to generally, uh, retweet and follow one of the other Osmo family Twitter accounts, but then you'll be put in a random drawing. The latest one is for three free months of Osmo premium content. They're giving away three, different uh prizes of that you'll all go into a drawing if you follow the instructions again osmo underscore com uh that pin tweet i believe this one is uh pick your favorite ppr running back hey the drawing's going to be in six days all you got to do is pick them 
There's no points in this one. Seems pretty easy. I think I will choose Dan Vogelbach as my favorite PPR wide receiver, Adam. I don't think I can lose with that. No, he looks like he'd be a great wide receiver. Excellent. All right, with that, gamers, good luck.